Hello and welcome to this, the fourth of our Culture Circle events um, as part of the Belong Beyond project. My name is Sarah Keane. And for those of you who maybe haven't joined us before, um, I am the uh, project coordinator with Access Ballymun and I'm the project manager of Belong Beyond, um, which is a, a project delivered in collaboration between ourselves and Access and the Dublin City Libraries. Um, it's a celebration of all things libraries and also of all things art and culture. Um, and we're here today to talk all things books. Um, and I'm delighted to be joined today for this lunchtime chat by Jackie Lynham from One Dublin, One Book. And we're going to learn a little bit more about what that is shortly. And by um, author and events programmer, uh, Sarah Webb. So thank you both for joining me. You're, you're very welcome to this fourth session of the, the Culture Circle, which is a, a, a nice informal chat where we talk about what we're reading, what we're watching, what we're looking forward to. Um, but what I would like to chat about first, Jackie, with you is what exactly One Dublin, One Book is. Hi, Sorka. Thanks for inviting me along. And hi, Sarah. Um, so One Dublin, One Book is a reading initiative that is run by Dublin City Libraries and it started in 2006 with its Swim to Words. It's going quite a long time now. And the idea behind it is to get people in Dublin and beyond reading the same book over the month of April. So the book chosen each year is one that's connected with the city in some way, either through the content of the book or the author itself. Um, so over the years, we have done um, several books, um, very well-known ones like Dracula and Dubliners by James Joyce. Um, and then more contemporary ones. Last year, it was Leonard and Hungry Paul by Roland Hessian. We did the Country Girls trilogy by Edna O'Brien, Tashi by Christine Dwyer Hickey, The Long Gaze Back um, collection of short stories by women writers edited by Sinead Gleeson. So lots of different books. Sometimes they fit in with centenary like in 2013 it was centenary of the 1913 knockout and that year it was trumpet city of course so yeah. it just depends really on the year what the book is um and this year's book is nora by Neil O'Connor. which is of course um uh, perfectly timed uh, and this conversation in fact is perfectly timed with the centenary um that people might have seen uh Ulysses popping up all over their uh their tvs and their their twitter uh home pages etc yesterday so can you tell us maybe a little bit about nora as your your first recommendation yeah so that's the, the cover now so there's a new one dublin one book edition that has just come out um so yeah we wanted to obviously mark the centenary of ulysses in some way while also really honoring a contemporary irish writer so that would be a big remit of the dublin unesco city literature office would be as well as you know acknowledging the great irish writers that people would know dublin for such as joyce and Beckett, but really also promoting contemporary irish writers as well so when we put a call out for suggestions for books that was the remit that we were looking for so um yeah we picked this great book nora by nula o'connor and it's um subtitle is a love story of nora barnacle and james joyce and nora, nula has uh, reimagined the the life story of nora and jim based on a lot of research so it's very much true to life um and we it starts off in dublin when uh, Nora is working in Finn's Hotel and meets James Joyce and they fall madly in love. And then he takes her off to Europe and they have this whirlwind kind of um, life together where they're moving from city to city. And she is his muse um, as well as, they don't, they're not married for a long time actually. I think that this is, a Nuna describes this very well in the book that Nora really wants to get married, but Jim is anti-establishment, anything, you know, anything that would, uh, mark him as a sort of you know normal guy he doesn't want anything to do with that and she really wants to get married but they don't get married until much later on but uh, it's a wonderful story it's a really engaging read and I think it's going to be a great book for people that might know James Joyce but may never have read him I think it'd be a nice segue into people and um, once they read the book that they might want to go off and read some of James Joyce's works. I have to say it's one that I'm really looking forward to to reading because like that, you know, I have obviously heard of James Joyce and I've attempted many times to read Ulysses, but haven't quite managed to get all the way through. Well, I think maybe as a as an introductory point to all of this work, but also as a really human exploration of who who Joyce and Nora were as individuals and as people which I think we can maybe sometimes forget that these great names like Joyce and Beckett and Shaw and whoever you can think of these these 
um, titans of the of the literary scene in in Ireland were also human beings with real lives, and and so I'm I'm excited to maybe exploring that side of it. Yeah, real lives and lots of flaws as well. I mean, I you know when you read Nora, you wonder how she put up with him. Really, to be honest with you, he wasn't an easy person to live with, and every so often he would decide he wanted some to live somewhere different, and she'd have to move with the children onto another city, and he drank a lot and like you know although Nora um loved him dearly and that really comes through in the book just how much she adored him you know he wasn't an easy person Mm -hmm. and I suppose maybe we only hear the greatness of his work um but behind as you say behind those great men of the literary canon there were women um trying to you know rear families as well and, and have some kind of stable life um but yeah, it's a really entertaining book as well. I mean, she paints really vivid pictures of, you know, the kind of lifestyle. They had very little money, but then when they would get money, they were completely flahoolock with it and just spend it all. And then they have no money again. And it's this kind of very unstable um, life, which is very entertaining to read about. I don't think I'd want to be living it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, a window into it, which is probably enough. Yeah, um, yeah. That's, so that's brilliant. That- yeah, we're hoping loads of people will read it now across the city. We're, this year, um, because Nora Barnacle was from Galway and Neil O'Connor is a Dublin writer but lives in Galway now, there's a very strong Galway connection. So we're really delighted that Galway Libraries are um, one of our partners this year. And oh, we're going to actually be starting the month of events in April with an event in Galway City Library. Great. So we're delighted about that. Um, we'll be announcing the programme on the 24th of February. Great. So if people keep an eye on one Dublin one book, Dolly, um, we have a whole program of events in April around the book. So we're hoping people will pick up a copy in their library or buy a copy um, in their bookshop and then read along and maybe come along to one of the events um, during the month just to learn a bit more about it. And so will these be that the uh, rare thing these days of in-person events? <laughs> yeah, well, yes, we will have some in-person events. So last year we were in the very difficult situation of being in lockdown during April. So um, all the libraries were shut, all the bookshops were closed as well. So everything last year went online. And um, but we still had a very successful month um, with Leonard and Hungry Paul. We were very uh, pleased with how it went so this year we're in a luckier position in terms of having in-person events so it'll be a mixture I don't think we're ever going to go back to having yeah. just in-person events solely I think it's really important that we bring the audience that we gained last year in international audience and also people that just for whatever reason can't make it to events whether it's for money or um disabilities or childcare or whatever reason it's important that they have access to our events as well that would be really a strong policy I think in Dublin City Libraries and most event organisers I'm sure Sarah would agree with me about this that um, is to make the events as accessible as possible so some of our events will be streamed and um, some will be online only and some will be in person and some will be a hybrid of the two yeah brilliant um, well, thanks very much for giving that kind of introduction to, to One Dublin, uh, One Book and to Nora. I'm going to come back to you for your recommendations in a, a few minutes, but I want to bring Sarah in there now. Um, as I mentioned and as Jackie alluded to there, you are also a programmer. Mm-hmm. Um, and I find, like as a programmer myself, um, I find it really interesting how people make decisions and what it is that kind of sparks their interest as programmers. So I thought I'd ask you maybe a little bit about what it is that you do um, and, and how you make those decisions. Yeah, well, I've worked as a programmer specialising in children's book events for nearly 30 years now. So it started when I was working in the bookshops because often there were authors who would come and the publishers were keen for them to do a signing on an event. So it wasn't a big thing at the time. So this would have been in the mid 1990s. Um, But I remember the first event I did was with Marita Conan McKenna, who has become one of my great friends over the years. And um, she was terrific. Um, And we kind of, between myself and Marita realized pretty early on that actually just sitting on a chair and reading to children is not the way to go, that they're looking for connection and story. So from working as a bookseller who was doing events on the side in the bookshop, um, 
I, when I left book selling to write, I continued on programming. I programmed for Mountains to See, which sadly isn't happening this year, but I'm sure we'll be back next year. Um, I've programmed for International Literature Festival Dublin. I was one of the consultants for Listow for a while. Um, yeah, I've worked with lots of different festivals and I've worked with the libraries very, very happily with DLR libraries on and off programming for them. And at the moment, I've, I'm the uh, family programmer for Molly Museum of Literature Ireland. So, and yeah, and I'm the event manager for Halfway Up the Stairs and yeah. So, <laughs> so it, yeah, it must be really yeah. interesting then all of those different kinds of festivals and events yeah. and how you you kind of figure out what your audience, particularly yeah. when it's a, a, a younger audience who maybe has a, a different set of needs or interests. Yeah, sure. So, I mean, I don't really what I, I start with the work, mm -hmm. which I think is really important. So I start with the book and the book or the work has to be amazing. And then I'll look at, well, with that book, uh, what can we do? What can we create around that book? Um, something I brought in quite a few years ago now, I think in 2014 or 15, with lovely Marion Keys from DLR Libraries, is we started doing um, events for children with autism. Mm -hmm. And that was the kind of first. So we, <laughs> our first event was around Oliver Jeffries' uh, book, where there's a starfish in it. And I asked uh, the Aquatic Centre down in Bray, would they bring a pool with starfishes in it that children could look at and would they be allowed to touch a starfish? Um, and then the next year we had a, a, a companion dog, an autism yeah. companion dog, and we used Oh No George. So oh, I love creating events, it's so much mm. fun. But for me, things like uh, access, which Jackie was mentioning is really important also having events for all children and also having events where all children can see themselves um i tend to program family events rather than children's events because i think it's a great opportunity for adults to play as mm. well you know i think as adults we need we need to play it's really really important um and so i love like when you have someone brilliant like chris Houghton or oliver jeffers or neve sharkey like on the floor especially with Neve, she does amazing monster doodles. But seeing the parents down there doodling monsters with Neve and the kids, I think, oh, gives me such a thrill. I've missed um, in-person events so much, you know. Um, Great. But this year, I've yep. already programmed some, so I can't wait to get back to it. Brilliant, that's time. fantastic. Um, so <laughs> I, I maybe while, while we're chatting there, Sarah, I'd like to ask you about your recommendations. I know we, we ask people to have you know, three or four recommendations, which is a, a challenge <laughs> for people who love books to narrow yeah. down. And I've been lucky enough that I'm on all of these chats. So I've managed to spread it out to about 12 or 14. <laughs> but um, what have you what have you brought for us today as a recommendation, Sarah? Well, I asked you, Sorka, could I recommend some children's books, which you very kindly said I would. But I believe that the best children's books are brilliant for adults as well as children. So I'm recommending these for everyone. Uh, <laughs> whatever your age. Uh, the first one, I'm kind of going to go backwards in age from mm -hmm. kind of the older age group. Um, this is a book um, that is absolutely amazing. I don't know if either of you have read um, Katya Balin. Um, it's called October, October, and it is about a girl called October who is wild. She lives in the forest with her father and they live a really wild existence, but her father has an accident and she has to go and live with her mom in the city. Um, and she uh, she finds this obviously really difficult because she's a wild child, but the children and the teachers in her school find it equally difficult because she's not an easy kid, but they all kind of grow to interact and engage with each other in really unusual ways, but it's absolutely beautifully written. It's extraordinary. Um, I work uh, part time in a bookshop down in Greystone, it's called Halfway Up the Stairs, and I pressed it into the hands of all the other uh, booksellers down there, and we all love it. It's just a really, really special book, um, but I think it could re be read um, by any age group, but it really makes you remember what it's like to be a child, and also that wildness that's in us all, but what would it be like if you were allowed to act on that wildness? It's beautiful. Mm. Uh, absolutely, absolutely gorgeous. And then... Uh, another one for, um, so I suppose we keep October, October in the 9 to 12 section, but as I say, it could be read by any age. 
I'd say they'd need to be maybe 10 plus, but I think adults would get just as much from it. Um, and the great thing about children's books is they're full of hope and they often have happy endings. So if you're looking for just a really nice read, mm. nothing like it. Um, the other one I wanted to mention is I love comic books and graphic novels. Um, I read them all the time, up and down the age groups, um, including the ones for grown-ups. But this one is Frankie's World by Eve Fadouli. And it is extraordinary. The artwork is just amazing. She's used this really limited palette um, of oranges and blues, and it really works. Um, it's kind of based loosely on her own life as a child. Um, I don't know if you know much about Aoife, but she was diagnosed um, as autistic when she was 27, which is quite a late diagnosis, but she always felt different as a child. And this is about Frankie, who feels very different as a child and goes off to find her father who she hasn't seen, but she, uh, it's this kind of whole mystery, but it is so funny and so sweet. Um, and I think anyone would really enjoy it, but like, you know, it's just amazing. I don't know if, um, even if you've never tried graphic novels or comic books, um, please do try it, it's brilliant. And then for the younger age group, <laughs> I chose this one here, which is called I Talk Like a River. Um, which I find very hard to talk about without crying. Uh, it's an amazing book. Um, Jordan Scott um, has a very bad stammer that he talks about a lot. And as he was growing up as a child, his father used to bring him to the river and explain to him how he talks like the river, uh, bubbling, whirling, churning and crashing. Um, the artwork is by Sydney Smith, who is um, a Canadian artist um, who has visited Ireland and uh, I did an event with them in DLR libraries, but it's just gorgeous. Mm. Um, yeah, I just love it. And I think, again, visual literacy is really important for children, you know, that they're exposed to loads of different kinds of artwork. Um, but this story, I think you could read to any age group. I just love it. But as an adult, I just love it too. It's a really, um, really, really engaging, immersive story and the artwork's terrific. So there you go. That is I Talk Like a River by Jordan Scott and Sydney Smith. So there's three. I have more. If I'm allowed. They're they're brilliant. They're they're <laughs> fantastic. And we, we might come back to you. We'll see how we are on the time. Um so I and I'm always struck, and it's something we we had a uh one of these chats that were specifically around children's literature recently, but I'm very struck how beautiful the books are, and I think it's a it's it's a joy and it's something that I always love to see in a book for an older audience when they take that the the kind of the visual impact of a book into uh, adult um literature as much as they do for children's literature because it's something that makes a big difference I think for me anyway to be able to kind of lose myself completely in the words but also have something visually beautiful to engage with um so they, they all look like really fantastic recommendations. So thank you. Um, Jackie, back to you. We've had Nora. What else have you got on your on your list for us? I have a few picked up. Before I say that, Sarah's far too modest, but I want to recommend Animal Crackers. You probably see in the background, um, Sarah has her standee there. So we chose this as our citywide read for children, which is just kind of like a one one book for children, where we pick a book um, to encourage children to engage positively with reading, to encourage reading for pleasure, really. And this was the first time that we ever picked a non-fiction book. And this is by Sarah and Alan Nolan, um, just beautiful illustrations. And we've had lots of events over the last few months. Unfortunately, most of them online. So I've only got to meet Sarah once in person for an event there at the Hugh Lane Gallery a few months ago. Um, but we're getting brilliant feedback from all the children and there's loads of copies available in the library. So if there's anybody watching um, that's looking for a great book for one of their children, whether they're a, re a you know, strong reader or a reluctant reader, this book is for everybody. So I just wanted to great. say that first. Yeah. I know Sarah wasn't going to say it. Um, okay, my first book is called Penenka, and it's, I'm sure you can see that oh, by, Le yeah, um, by Leonard and Hungry Paul author Ronan Hesh. So Leonard and Hungry Paul was our book, our Dublin book last year. 
Um, but this is the second novel, and um, it's quite different to Leonard. I don't know whether either of you have read Leonard and Hungry yeah, Paul, but it's quite yeah. a popular um, choice and done really well for us in the libraries over the last couple of months. This is the second novel, and it's quite it's a bit darker um, in themes, and it's about a man called Joseph, who's known as Penenka, and he carries a lot of pain, I suppose, with him. And when we meet him, he's 50, and he's suffering from what he calls the Iron Mask, who's debilitating headaches and his prognosis is not good um, and he's carrying a lot of regrets from his um, marriage breakup and his estranged daughter Mary Therese is back in his life with his grandson Arthur and it's just a beautiful uh, story about relationships um, and friendships and um, just trying to let go of things that you can't change and there's a beautiful description um, halfway through the book where Penenka goes for a, a haircut and he goes to a different hairdresser to his normal one. And <laughs> he's kind of looking at everybody there and thinking they're all going to outlive him. And he's feeling quite vulnerable. And um, the hairdresser, Esther, who he's never met before, is just so loving and tender towards him when he's when she's giving him the haircut that it kind of becomes undone. Um, he lets down his defences momentarily. And it's really beautifully written scene um made me cry and the book is like that it's just it'll make you think and it'll make you um is uh, what i really like about um ronan's books he's only written two so far i'm looking forward to the his next lot um in london Hungry paul it made me think about people that are different and how we treat people that we mm. maybe think are not as successful you know to the outside world and this one made me think about friendships um Lenka's friendship with esther and how we often try to push labels on people or labels on relationships. Um, and, you know, men and women can have a very strong relationship that's not sexual, but is definitely love. And that was a really um, interesting topic in the book. So that's my first recommendation. So it's Penenka by Ronan Hessian. And everything I'm going to recommend is in the library. So you can uh, check with your local library for that one. And then the second one, I've just started reading this one. So I haven't finished. So I can't give a you know, a definite <laughs> recommendation, but um, what I'm trying to do, so I've just changed my reading habits recently. I, for the last 10 years, I've been working in the Sibylle Lish office and I've loved it. And my reading has primarily been Irish authors, mm -hmm. um, a mixture for work and pleasure or both. Um, but I decided at the end of last year that I was going to try and widen my reading choices and read more books in translation. So I am looking at the long list for the Dublin Literary Award, which was just announced on Monday. So that is, I'm not sure whether you're familiar with that circuit. That's, um, I am. And it's, yeah. it's a, like as a, as a list for people who are hungry for maybe books that they haven't come across, it is a fantastic resource. It's really, yeah. like, I spent a, a, a long time when it was announced recently, just looking through everything and, and marking on the list what I'm going to look up. And so it's a, for somebody who loves a, a list and an Excel spreadsheet and that kind of thing, it's, um, it's really my dream. Yeah, well, it's a long list. So all the nominations come from libraries. So it's very different to any other award in that it's not pushed by publishers or the media. Um, nominations come from libraries all around the world. So there's 79 books on the long list this year. And this has actually gone down. So a couple of years ago, the list usually was around 150 books. Mm -hmm. So it's gone down because the libraries are now nominating one book rather than three. Mm -hmm. So this year, there are 30 books in translation. Now, I'm not going to get to read 30 books in the next couple of months, but I'm hoping to read maybe four or five. Um, before the shortlist is announced in March. Um, I think it's the 22nd of March. And then the winner will be announced on the 19th of May. We'll see how many I get through. But I put a call out on Twitter for suggestions. Um, and this one, The Disaster Tourist, was suggested by um, Dennis O'Driscoll, who um, reviews books and translation for the Irish Times. So he said he really liked this one. So it's by Jan Cohen. I'm not sure if I pronounced that right. And translated by Lizzie Buhler. And it's about this woman in Korea and she works for this really dodgy company that sells package holidays to disaster zones. And um, she has just been, she, her boss is just a despicable human being who is you know, her, sexually harassing the staff and she decides she needs to resign. But he, anyway, she gets sent on this holiday and she can pick any of the disaster zones to go to. And this one is in Nui in Thailand and there's a sinkhole. So I'm about 50 pages in and it's really engaging so far and a sort of a dark satirical look at um, the tourism industry, mm. at patriarchy, at um, environmental issues. 
So I'm really enjoying it so far. So that was a good recommendation from Declan. And then another one that I've just, I have finished and can definitely recommend is this one here. Um, so this is called The Housekeeper Plus the Professor. And it's a Japanese book and it's by Yoko Ogawa. And it is translated by Stephen Schneider. So this was one, another one I got recommended to me from Twitter people. If you're ever looking for recommendations, go on Twitter. There's no end of people willing to share their love of books. Um, so this one is about a woman who goes to work as a housekeeper for a maths professor, but he is suffering from a very severe memory loss and he can only, his short term memory only lasts for 18 minutes at a time. So every time she goes, each day that she goes, she has to introduce herself to him all over again. But his love and passion is for numbers. So he um, creates these really difficult maths puzzles that um, appear in magazines. And she's like myself, wouldn't have a lot of uh, interest in maths and numbers. And he just gradually, with his his passion and his love um, for the numbers, she starts to become really interested. And it's about the relationship that develops between the two of them. And also she's a 10 year old son. She's a single mother. And when he hears this boy is going home alone after school, he insists that she brings him every day to work. And then this beautiful friendship develops between um between the three of them really. So I really recommend that one. And again, I got this from the library. So um, the great thing about, you obviously know, but people watching might know that if you want to order a book and if it's not in your local library, if it's available in any public library in Ireland, you can reserve it and it'll be delivered to your local library often within a couple of days. So I've went a bit trigger happy with the reserves and ordered <laughs> Kind of about 20 books came in within two weeks to me um all in translation so i've got lots to keep me going for the next couple of months they're brilliant and i'm really struck actually by your 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 recommendations and the, the um the friendship and the kind of the idea of connection that come out through through all of them particularly that idea of somebody you know, and I think we've probably all met somebody like this who has an interest in something that we are either not interested in or know nothing about, but their passion is enough to carry you through and you're interested in it purely because of how much they enjoy the whatever the topic is, but also enjoy sharing that. And there's, so, there's a really lovely connection in that and sharing the things that you're passionate about. Um, which is, I suppose, a nice segue to thank you both for sharing the things that you're <laughs> passionate uh, about. I have um, one suggestion that I always keep mine in reserve. Now, I know we could we could talk for another two hours, so there's no real need for me to, to bring these. But you mentioned the environment. So I am actually going to bring show this one, which is Mary Robinson's book, um, Climate Justice. And I'm very proud of this copy because it is, in fact, signed. Huh. Um, which is something I'm very proud of, and I think Mary Robinson is something we can all is someone we can all be very proud of as um, Irish citizens, uh, and as I think uh, women in Ireland, she she um, is a, an, a, an extraordinary uh, role model in how to be a, a leader and how to be a, a woman in politics. She sorry, this, I just want to say she, yeah. she came in to do an event for us actually in Great. Street Library yeah. about that book a couple of years ago. Yeah, she's fantastic. Yeah, it's really fantastic. And so this book, for anybody who hasn't discovered it, is um, Climate Justice, a man-made problem with a feminist solution. And she looks at all sorts of different um, kind of impacts of uh, the climate crisis on um, the world. And it is, it, it obviously the climate crisis is something we hear a lot about and it's something that we is very challenging and quite scary, but this is a very uh, straightforward read. I wouldn't say it's an easy read, but mm. it is uh, very well written. It's very um, kind of straightforward. And Mary Robinson is um, a bit of a genius and a bit of a hero of mine. So I thought I'd mm -hmm. uh, mention that one in case anybody hasn't come across it. Yeah. Um, and I also want to plug while we're here, this is technically the last week of the Belong Beyond project. Um, it, it wraps officially on Monday. And as a very special gift to everybody, we're going to have a fifth culture circle on Monday at lunchtime. Um, so we will be here having this chat again with some more Irish authors um, about their recommendations. And uh, you'll find us on Facebook at 1.15 um, on Monday the 7th. Um, and there will be highlights from the project being shared throughout the, the day. 
the project does stay up online so if you are only discovering us now never fear the podcasts are all out on Spotify there are 12 uh, there are 13 episodes a bonus episode with Anne Ingle recorded with First Fortnight and 12 episodes recorded um with artists and guests across the Dublin City Libraries. There are children's animations on YouTube. The the previous Culture Circle conversations are on YouTube. So there is a whole host of things there for you to find um, and to enjoy. And if you, as I said, if you're only discovering us now, or if you've only started to dip your toe into the Belong Beyond project, we would absolutely invite you to explore a little bit further over the next couple couple of months. Um, Which leads me then to say thank you very much to Jackie and to Sarah uh, for joining us, for giving us an insight into programming, into One Dublin, One Book, and into what it is that you you both read and where you find your uh, your inspiration and your next next kind of books to read. Uh, So thank you very, very much for joining us today. Thank you. Sarka and well done. Sarka, thank you. Well done on your project. Thank you very much.